Y'all know what it is, Jay Williams, Let's Live Life, and we're back. Some of the hardest things you're going to have to deal with while locked up. As an inmate, as an offender, as a convict, you're going to have to deal with things that are out of your control. You're going to have to deal with things you don't want to deal with. See things you don't want to see. Today, we're going to get into some of those things. Let's relive it. All right, so the first thing, before we even get started, this ain't nothing I wrote down. This ain't scripted. This ain't something I even got to put much thought into. We're doing any amount of time, any substantial amount of time. You recall right offhand the things that you hated the most, the things you had to deal with, and all the things that were out of your control. So we're going to start this off with a story. One of the things you're going to deal with that's out of your control, might be in your control, you can jump in it if you want to, is seeing people get picked on. Seeing guys get preyed on by other guys, and there's nothing nobody can do about it. You can jump in there if you want to, but the moment you do that, you have now inherited that beef. You have now signed up for whatever he was dealing with, it's now yours. We had a guy in my pod, and he was in a cell with a gang member, a high-ranking gang member. One reason or another, the guards go up and they shake the cell down one day. They find a knife. Nobody's claiming the knife. And the way that the shank situation works, having stuff in the cell works, you can have whatever you want in there. But if for some reason they find it, man up and own up to it. It's yours. You tell the people it's yours. Me and my cellies, Always had that understanding. I would tell cellmates, hey, I got a banger. If anything would ever happen, I'll wear mine. Don't worry about it. Same with you. You got a cell phone or you got a knife. You got wine. You got weed. You got dope. You got whatever you got. I don't care. As long as you wear yours. As long as when they come in here and they find that shit, you say, hey, it's mine. So they go up in the cell, they're shaking the cell down, and this is the middle of the night. This is like 12, 30, 1 o'clock at night, a lot of guys are sleeping, and we hear them out there, we hear their keys rattling, like the keys always give away that the guards are near. You can hear them when they walk, you hear the static from their walkie-talkie, you can hear their military boots. <sighs> they find this knife. Oh boy, the gang member dude's not wearing it, he's not, he's not owning up. To his knife. He's not telling them it's his. So they're getting ready to lock him and his cellmate up. And take them both to the hole. For a knife. The dude that it don't belong to. Told on dude. Everybody heard him. He told him. That's not my knife. That's his knife. Homeboy you need to tell him. That's your knife. That is a no no. You do not. You do not do nothing like that. That's going to get your ass killed. Regardless of whether dude should have owned up to it or not. You just told on somebody you're now labeled, right? So they locked the blood dude up. As soon as the little dude says, hey, it belongs to him, they locked the, the, the big blood dude up, right? Dude tells him, y'all can't leave me in here, man. Y'all got to take me up out of here late. I just told on that man. Everybody heard me tell on him. And we're hearing him say this. He's like, y'all got to lock me up. Like, y'all got to move me, put me on another part of the compound. I can't stay over here, right? So they take him as well. He tells me fears for his life. He doesn't want to be in population over here. Put me in a hole and relocate me. I need to shave, man. His mustache stays tickling my nose. So the, the big blood dude goes to the hole. And the little dude that just told on him goes to the hole as well. Well, he has a brother in there. And his brother had been on our side of the yard in the past. And something had happened that his brother went to the hole. Everybody's trying to figure out where dude is, they're told. Where did he come out? What building is he in? What part of the compound is he on? Because they want to fly a kite over there and get their blood homies or brothers to smash this dude to run down on him for snitching on homeboy for the knife, right? A couple months goes by and we ain't heard nothing about this dude since he left. But out the blue, his brother shows up in our pod. 
His brother ain't got nothing to, and him and his brother looked a lot of like, you hear dudes say they're brothers and they're really not. They might know each other from the streets and they get in there, oh, that's my brother. It's very common. They actually were brothers. They had the same last name. They looked a lot of like, you could tell, you know, without even asking that they were brothers. Well, his brother shows up and his brother's more of a, a laid back dude. And the first dude, he was laid back. But his brother's a small dude, man. He's not nobody that beaten up would really take any effort to do, right? He's not in there long. He comes in, brings his bags in, goes to his cell, makes his rack, puts his stuff up, comes out. And in the meantime, he doesn't know that his brother's labeled a rat and that there's a whole bunch of shit going on behind it, right? These dudes really feel some type of way about this dude telling on this, on this dude for this knife, right? Not to mention this dude is now going to get shipped to a max custody level, you know, eight, nine hours away. So they push up on dude's brother. Hey, what's up with your brother, man? And you can see right out there, I mean, it's a lot of dudes, like four or five dudes that push up on him. He's like, what do you mean? They're like, he told him on such and such, like straight told him that's his knife, got him locked up, and then he checked in. He's like, man, I, I ain't got I ain't got nothing to do with that. They're like, that's your brother, man. Somebody's got to... Somebody's got to wear this ass, but man, you, ain't, you can't walk around in here and your brother's a rat. So he's telling these dudes, look, man, I ain't got nothing to do with what my brother did, man. I didn't do it. And right then and there, I started feeling bad because I knew what was coming. This is a small dude. Everybody that's running their mouth, that's threatening him is bigger than him. There's way more of them than, you know, he's got friends or any type of associates that are willing to help him. He's all by himself, man. He's a loner. That night, we would come back from chow, and then we locked down. And after lockdown, the dudes, you know, was all congregating, plotting. And you can always tell when somebody's plotting. Well, they call wreck. We all go out to wreck. And they get this dude on the side of the building. The one dude is like, yo, let me walk with me, man. Let me talk to you. And I think dude knew what was coming. You could see it in his in his demeanor and the way he held his shoulders. Kind of like, like kind of like when you scold one of your kids. You know how they like slump down. He's like scared looking. So these guys, what they're doing is they're trying to get him around the side of the building where nobody can see him. The cameras on the wreck yard don't work, and there's this blind spot I've told you on the back of the building where the guards can't see. They get this dude over there and start talking to him about his brother again. He's like, man, I told y'all. I ain't got nothing to do with what my brother did. And he's trying to plead his case, which really, it ain't got nothing to do with him. And before he can finish, they just jump on him. And we're all watching, and they are just, the first hit just laid this, this young dude down, man. They laid him flat on the blacktop. He fell, hit his head hard. And then it was just them taking turns. I'm not taking turns because they were all hitting him at once. It's like five of them just beating him punching him, kicking him, and he's laying on the ground, he's screaming, he's yelling, this dude might not have ever been in a fight in his life, man, he didn't look like the type that had ever been in a fight, and they just beat the holy shit out this dude, man, behind something his brother had done, I remember standing there watching this dude get beat up, and just feeling helpless, feeling bad for him, he wasn't no bad dude, he had never done nothing to nobody, but because of who his brother was and what his brother did, they were now just beating him, man. Just doing everything they could to hurt him bad. They walked off after they beat him up and left him laying there. And he was so messed up that he laid on the ground for three or four minutes. Couldn't get up. Ribs broken. Legs hurt. Face is just mangled. There's blood all over his shirt. He's got dirt smeared into the blood on the side of his face. And I remember just feeling so bad for this dude. That's one of the things you're going to have to deal with that you're not going to enjoy while you're locked up. It's seeing guys like that get hurt, knowing they're good dudes and there's nothing you can do to save that man. You're either predator or prey when you're locked up. There is no win between. There is no fine line of you could be right in the middle. You're either at some point or another going to be the person that gets hurt or the person that hurts somebody.
It just sucks when you see somebody that didn't do anything wrong and didn't want no problems get hurt and scream like that. And there's nothing you can do to help them. Next thing on my list is 100% going to be lack of privacy. Anybody that's ever been locked up, as soon as you heard me say lack of privacy, I'm sure your brain went back to all the things that get stripped from you once you get locked up. Whether it be taking a shower with other men. One of my biggest issues and one of the things I got used to it, you know, to this day it don't bother me. That used to bother me was using the bathroom in front of another man. Now, this is going to be something that, depending on how much time you do, you're going to have to do a lot. If you're in a dorm setting, and I've been in a lot of dorms, the way it's set up is it's usually, you know, anywhere from, it's usually about five toilet bowls sitting side by side, and then three or four urinals side by side beside those toilets. There is no little wall to divide you and the next man. There's no partition. There's nothing to keep y'all's knees from bumping while you're sitting on the toilet. There's no type of privacy. I can remember my homeboy Dooley, me and Dooley, sitting on the toilet using the bathroom and sharing a magazine. That's just, just how prison is. You know what I mean? He's holding half, I'm holding half, I'm reading the same magazine while we're using the bathroom. Now, the cell's a lot different. When you're in the cell, it's you and one man in the cell. I used to hate, and I cannot reiterate the word hate enough. I used to hate when I would get those cellmates that always seemed to have to take a shit soon as the cell door locked. And I'd say it every time, bro, you had all day to use the bathroom. Why do you wait until we lock down? And I got to be in here with you to use the bathroom. Now I got to smell you. I got to hear the noises you make while you use the bathroom. It's just an uncomfortable feeling. That's one of the parts of there being no privacy. We would take paper clips and I could get hot glue for maintenance. And we would bend the, the paper clip like an L, like almost like a fishing hook and glue it on one side of the wall. Then glue one on the other side of the wall. You could hang a sheet up to kind of give you a little bit of privacy and cut you in the toilet area off from, you know, the man sitting on the bunk. Everything you do when you're locked up, for the most part, is known. If you're in a cell and you're just trying to release some stress, you're in there, you know, doing your thing. Y'all get where I'm going with that, right? Everybody already knows. You got the pillow in the door. They don't hear the toilet flush. And they're like, oh, he's in there getting money. He's in there, you know, masturbating, beating off, whatever. Even an act like that is common knowledge to everybody around you. The lack of privacy is something that you never, ever really get used to. You can be on the phone. And somebody be sitting next to you on the phone and they listen to your whole conversation. You might be talking freaky to your girl or whatever. And you got this guy beside you listening in to the whole conversation. Anything from making wine to smoking weed, smoking cigarettes. Somebody's going to know. Because like I said, somebody's always watching. That was definitely a big thing I hated about incarceration was a lack of privacy next is waiting you wait to wait and then you wait some more you're gonna wait on everything everything from using the microwave to using the phone to using the shower getting some hot water everything is a waiting game there is somebody in front of you. Turn this window up, man. Chop saws are running. There is somebody in front of you, usually at all times. 
So just for you to get in the microwave to heat your little meal up, you got to go up there. Hey, who's next in the microwave? You find out who it is. Hey, who's got after you? Who's got after you? Who's got after you? Who's got after you? It might be 15 people in front of you. And you don't need to use the microwave for 30 seconds. You don't realize how blessed you are to have these small things in your everyday life. These are the things you miss the most that get taken from you when you get locked up. You might want to use the phone. There might be so many people in line on the phone that by the time you get to the phone or it's your turn, it's time to lock down. Might not get to make your phone call. So the waiting and the privacy are definitely two things you're going to deal with and you're going to learn to accept what you're never going to like. Next thing for sure is going to be cellmates. Now, I've had some good dudes in the cell with me. I can't lie. Been lucky, man. I've had some some really, really cool guys, man. Guys I knew from the streets. Guys I knew from prison. Guys that I, you know, sure enough clicked up with. My homeboy, Jacob Aquino. One of the best cellies I ever had. Was a good dude. My homeboy, Adentrius. Great celly, man. Good dude. But then you're going to get put in the cell or have someone put in your cell once your cellmate goes home, goes to the hole, ships, whatever the case may be. When a bunk comes open, you get no say-so of who they put in your cell. I might do a second part to this today because I got some crazy cellmate stories. And I got one that I ain't ever told y'all that y'all ain't even ready for. But in getting these cellmates, you don't get to pick and choose who comes in your cell. There is no compatibility check. There is no, are these two going to get along? All they do is they look down the list. All right. In seven building, we got three cells open. Cell, let me see, 110, top bunk is open. 115, bottom bunk is open. 132, top bunk is open. Three guys show up, either from the whole, another institution, wherever they came from. And they don't even care who they put them in the cell with. They just shove them in a cell. I had a celly, and the bad thing is he wasn't a bad dude, but he snored. And when I mean he snored, he snored so hard that I could feel my bed rattling. And he slept above me. I would hit the bed. Boom, 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 boom. Come on, man. Roll over on your side or something. I can't sleep. He'd roll over. Everything be good. Then eventually he'd roll back over on his back. And he'd be snoring. <laughs> and you're just laying there with your eyes open. Three o'clock in the morning. Like, you finally got to sleep. You start snoring. You open your eyes. like, oh, my God. I'm going to kill this dude, man. I had that cellmate for the longest time, about six months, and I just couldn't take it no more. I told him, I said, bro, we're cool and all. You a cool dude, but we can't bunk together, man. We can't be in the same cell. I ain't getting no sleep. Like, it ain't nothing against you, but the snoring shit is driving me nuts, man. I be thinking about taking a pillow and smothering your ass at night while you sleep. I used to do little shit just to to mess with him because he irritated me. Like he was he was snoring one night and I was eating some Cheetos and I took a chunk of Cheeto and dude was laying up there with his mouth open. And I dropped the Cheeto in his mouth and he started choking. Oh, so don't don't be messing with me while I sleep. I said, bro, just roll over on your side, man. What you put in my mouth? I said, I put a Cheeto in your mouth. He didn't do nothing about it. I mean, he knew how to beat his ass in that cell. So I tell dude, look, where we got a dilemma, man. You know what I mean? I fuck with you. I rock with you. A good dude. But I can't deal with that snoring, man. I just can't. Like, you got to go, bro. You got to get up out of here. Like, you know, and there's only one or two ways that you're going to get up out of there. We're going to fight. And one of us is going to leave. 
Or you can go to the guards and say, hey, look, me and dude ain't compatible, man. You know, for whatever reasons, when another cell comes open, can you move me? And if you're not a trouble starter, you're not somebody that always causing problems for the guards. A lot of times they would rather move you than something happen and then somebody say, well, I tried to tell y'all, y'all didn't do nothing about it. And then they end up having to do more paperwork. So they moved the dude up out the cell. We were still talk out in the pod, talk on the yard and stuff. We were still cool. We just couldn't bump. I had another cellmate that had the worst gas like you could ever imagine in your life. This man smelled like, like he ate zombies for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Like he ate old duck eggs all day. Like he had just been eating little chicken embryos. This dude would just fart. No matter what. He could drink a glass of water and this dude would start farting. And the smell was so rancid and disgusting. And me and dude actually get to fighting behind it because I felt disrespected. I told him, I said, bro, you can't just lay on the top bunk and lay up in there and bust ass all night. I'm right below you. Have some respect. Like maybe you're new to prison or whatever. But if you got to let wind cut wind, bust ass, go over by the door. Get off your bunk and go stand by the door and do it that way. The smell goes out the cell. I'm laying on the bed one night and I got my headphones on and I'm watching my little TV so I can't hear anything. But then the odor hits me. Boom. Strong. Rancid. Disgusting. I said, oh, hell no. Nah. So I lay there for a minute like, I know this dude didn't just lay on the top bunk and just bust ass, man. I know he didn't. This dude farts in his sleep. It never stops. So I take my headphones off. I'm like, oh, homeboy. What up, Jay? I'm like, you just gonna lay up there, man, and just fart all over me. Just crop dust me. Just, we done spoke about this several times, man. You know what I mean? Like, this shit ain't flying no more. You guys to go, man. You gotta, me and you can't, we can't bunk together, man. I'm not gonna be in here in a walking septic tank. You know what I mean? Peppy Le Pew ass dude, man. So as I'm talking to dude, I'm standing there and he's got his legs like, he's got his knees kind of bent up and he's sitting on the top bunk. And I was like, go ahead, get down, man. Roll your stuff up and get out. Like, you got to get out the cell. Dude kicks at me. I guess he wasn't like, he wasn't moving fast enough. So I reached up to grab his leg. I was going to help him get his ass off the bunk. And this dude kicks at me. So when he kicks at me, I grab his leg and I pull him. Now you got to think this bunk is five foot off the ground. And when you fall, it's nothing but hard concrete. I wasn't in, I wasn't looking to hurt the dude. I was once I pulled him. When I reached for his leg, I was more or less trying to guide his ass in the direction of you gonna get up off that bunk, you gonna start packing your stuff up, and you, you know, you gonna get up out this cell. He kicks at me, I grab his leg, I pull him off the bunk, smacked his head and his back crazy hard, was rolling around on the ground, you know. I didn't have to do anything else to the dude after that. A couple minutes goes by, he gets up, packs all his stuff up, and guards come by during count, and he tells the guards, after count, y'all need to move me. And he's got this big-ass goose egg on the back of his head where his head hit the floor. And they're like, what's going on, Williams? And by now, I'm back on my bunk with my headphones on watching TV, and I just kind of cut my eyes with the door, I'm like, ain't nothing. Like, why does your cellmate want to move? I said, I don't know why you want to move, man. He was like, I just need to move, man. It's, that's just what it is. Either y'all can move me, or when we come out, I'm going to sit down in the middle of the pod, and when it's time to lock back down, I'm going to refuse, and y'all got to take me to the hole. So you can either move me to another cell, or you can start doing paperwork to lock me up, right? So they moved the dude out the cell. I get a new cellmate. I could go on and on and on about how miserable it can be having these cellmates you're not compatible with. I never let them put nobody in my cell that had sexual related charges. I never let them put nobody in my cell that had charges against a woman, that had charges against children. That's a no-no. Once you get in the cell with me, me and you're going to start chopping it up. And I've told you, you don't ask people why they're locked up but if we're going to live in the same cell together, 
I'm 100% going to need to know why you're in prison. Because you are who you hang around with. And the last thing you ever want is anybody to think that you condone the people that do that type of stuff or that you're okay with it. And aside from what people think or would say, I'm not okay with it. So I never had nobody like that in the cell with me. I did have a celly one time that had choked a man to death with his belt. He's about to get out soon. He's not a bad dude. You know what I mean? He was all messed up on crack one night. They were in a crack house. He uh, sent the guy to get some, some more crack. The guy came back. Dude felt like he had ripped him off. He had his back to him. He pulled his belt off, looped it, put it around the dude's neck. Choked him to death right there in front of the dude's girlfriend. They were all crackheads in a crack house. So this dude got into details of telling me how he choked the dude to death with the belt. The noises to make, the guy made, you know, how it left this big ass mark around the dude's neck. They showed it trial, how his eyes looked like they were going to pop out of his head. And the dude was reaching back, fighting at him while he was had his belt pushed around his neck, choking him. And... Me and the guy that I'm talking about that, that did this, we was cool. We were all right. But I never really felt at ease. I never really felt 100% comfortable around this dude. Like I didn't like him moving around when I was sleeping just because of the fact he had choked somebody to death with a belt. Like You don't want somebody that's told you they've done something like that to just be up and about moving around in the middle of the night because you already know what they've done and what they're capable of. He was actually one of the last cellies I had at that institution before I got transferred. Other things you're going to deal with with cellmates, like if we go back to the bathroom thing, you're dead sleep. Your toilet is in your cell. Somebody gets up in the middle of the night, uses the bathroom. Now they flush the toilet and woke you up out your sleep. Like this, and I understand sometimes you can't hold it, you got to go. But it sucks when you're already in a place where you're never really comfortable, never complacent, never content. You just kind of live life each day until, you know, you either die of old age, get killed by somebody, or go home. It sucks when you finally get that moment of peace and you finally drifted off to sleep, and then that toilet. <laughs> flushes and your eyes fly open and there's your celly on the toilet or walking back from the toilet, stepping on the counter, climbing back on the top bunk. Cellmate thing is always going to be a big issue. You hate to see a good cellmate leave because you never know who's going to walk through that door next. Now I'm thinking about this. I'm going to give you all the one thing that came to mind that for me, was one of the hardest things to deal with while locked up that also transferred out into the streets, out into the real world. And that was the disrespect you're going to receive from some of these guards. Now, I'm not going to say all the guards. To sit here and say all guards are bad, all guards are pieces of shit would be a lie because I've been treated fair human by some of these guards but you got some of these guards you can come across in prison in jail that got a chip on their shoulder maybe their kids disrespect them at home all day you big dummy shut up nobody listen to you maybe they got picked on in high school maybe they were overweight and couldn't make it as a police officer but for whatever reason and this is in every institution across America. You've got guards that power trip. You've got guards with egos, with chips on their shoulders. Now the difference in this, what I'm about to tell you, is they can disrespect you and nothing comes of it. Because if you write it up, you know, you push a request for them saying, hey, you got a guard that's out of line. It just goes to another guard. They ain't going to do nothing but call him in there, and he ain't going to do nothing but lie. So that's pointless. I've been beat up by guards. My brother's been beat up by guards. 
I know a lot of dudes that have been beat up by guards, right? For the most part, nothing ever happens to them. They don't go to jail. They don't lose their job. They don't end up in the hole. They don't go to court. The moment you decide you've had enough of this dude's mouth, his tough guy attitude, him disrespecting you, doing little things in day-to-day -day life, like constantly shaking your cell down, calling you out your name, gritting on you. The moment you decide you've had enough of that and you lash out, and I've seen it so many times, man. Dudes just get fed up with a certain guard disrespecting them. And the next thing you know, it's BOOM! Fuck his ass up. Beating the guard's ass. Well, now you're going to court. And you ain't going to no little jail kangaroo court. You are going to street court. You are going in front of a judge in whatever county, whatever city that prison is in. And you're going back in front of the judge for assault. For assault an officer. And nine times out of ten. What they usually do here in Virginia is. You get five years. Put your hands on one of them correction officers if you want to. You're going to get a five year sentence. You don't touch the guard. You don't hit the guard. You let him run his mouth. You've been dealing with this for years. Of guards just like him. Dealing with him. Other ones that come along, and it kind of turns you into a tea kettle. You're already in a in a messed up spot, stripped of all the people you love, all your physical, you know, possessions in life, your children. Your just everyday rights to just be a human have all been stripped away from you. And now you've got this man that bleeds red just like you do. That makes it his job to make your life a living hell. It could be a woman. I've dealt with those too. And you just take it. You take it. And it gets to feel like, like there's somebody sitting on your chest. There's so much pressure inside of you from the stress and what these people are putting you through that on the outside you're calm. But on the inside, you're just screaming at the top of your lungs. Screaming all the time. Because of what you're dealing with. I saw many a guard get his ass whooped. I've seen female guards get their asses whooped. And then I've seen it go to the point where dudes was done talking. And had taken so much from the guard. That they decided to try to take them up out of here by stabbing them. In my earlier stories I talked of a guard named Brantley. Brantley was a younger big black dude man. Big youngin. Maybe mid 20s. And him and dude had words, and Brantley tried to fight this dude in front of everybody. Dude would go on shortly after that to stab Brantley a whole bunch of times. Brantley transferred to the Department of Probation out in Chesterfield County. So, that anybody watching this got P.O. Brantley as your probation officer, I feel bad for you. It sucks when your mom comes to see you or a loved one comes to see you and you hear that they've been disrespected by the guards, that the guards are talking down to them. The guards are, you know, going above and beyond when it comes to searching your toddler. And the whole time they're doing it, they're running their mouth. You never, ever will get used to the disrespect that comes with dealing with some of these guards. You see them come on, you know, you know, they do three days on, two days off, so and so. That's how their, their schedule works. They don't work five days straight. It's usually three days on, two days off, three days on, two days off. You see this guard come on and immediately your whole demeanor just changes. Just knowing that he's coming to work today, you wake up in a foul mood. You wake up, look out the door first thing in the morning, you see him and you're like, God, man, I hate this motherfucker, man. What did I do to deserve this? You and this dude go back and forth, trading words. And the next thing you know, they're putting you in handcuff, locking you up and hauling you off to the hole. Because now he feels threatened. He's the aggressor in the situation. 
But at any moment, he can say, he threatened me. Or I feel for my, I fear for my life. Or he came at me in an aggressive manner. And regardless of whether you did that or not, they lock you up. I've seen guards lock guys up just because they did not like them. Guys that had never done nothing to them, weren't a problem, just didn't like the way they look. Next thing you know, they're putting all their stuff in clear trash bags and taking this man to the hole because the guard says he fears for he fears for his life or he makes up some lie or something somebody said. 99.9% .9 of the times, whether it's a lie or it's the truth, if a guard says you did it, signs on that paper, and is willing to stand behind what he said, you're going to get found guilty. You leave jail, you leave prison, and all that animosity, all that stress, all that pressure you've got on your chest, it's still there. You never got it out. So you return to the world and everybody says you're angry. Everybody says you got an attitude. Damn right you're angry. Damn right you got an attitude because you got so much pent up anger and unresolved things going on inside of you because of the way you were treated by someone that was supposed to make sure you were safe, by someone that was supposed to do their job and come home and not come do their job in a manner that makes everybody uncomfortable. That's why a lot of times you'll see guys get to fighting in there and they end up hurting somebody way beyond what the person deserved, way beyond what they expected to do to the person. And it's not always because they dislike that person that much. A lot of times it's because you get so fed up with just your everyday living conditions and what's going on around you, you bottle it all up. And then when it comes out, whoever catches it, catches the bad end of an ass whooping. That most likely, all of that anger didn't belong to him. So that's what it is, man. These are some of the things that you're going to dislike. Some of the things I disliked. Some of the things I hated about being locked up. Like I've told you in the past, I can do video after video after video on this subject. But these are just some of the things that came to mind. If you're a correctional officer, and I'm sure correctional officers watch my show. If you're a correctional officer, a police officer, anybody with any type of authority, think about how you treat people. Don't use your badge, your title, or your position to make somebody's life already worse than what it is. Do your job and go home. There is no super cop trophy. There is no super guard award. You will not be honored for being the biggest dickhead in the system. Treat people as if they were family or as if you knew them. Look at them as if that's somebody's child. That man's got a father and a mother or a wife and kids out there that love him. Now, if he's a chomo, a rapist, hey, fuck him. You know what I mean? He don't deserve to breathe. He don't deserve to live, much less have a good time. But to the everyday dudes that are locked up, let them be. Do your job. You ain't got to go above and beyond. But anyways, man, these detention centers, prisons, facilities, jails, they're all just crazy worlds inside of this already crazy world we live in and y'all know what i'm doing i'm just trying to keep y'all entertained are you not entertained and as always this is jay williams let's live life to all my real ones and the awesome real ones watching because y'all still watching me y'all know how we do salute